So I'm Dar from D-Way, which is made up of myself, Dar Brannock, uh, Joe Cohan, and Giovanna Santoro. We, I suppose, when I think about unbuilt, I think about unwrapping something. So we decided we'd do a quick chat about uh, on our process. So unwrapping how buildings get built and how we think about buildings and how we think about the methodology we go from start to finish. So I'll talk you through some of the, the key focuses of how we design and things that are important to us and hopefully that might give you an insight into how we think and things are important to us. So this is DUA which stands for Design Urbanism Architecture as we, we do a kind of a range of uh, projects from uh, small uh, tables and vases um, to houses and restaurants and office fit outs right up to kind of urban design of towns etc. Um, so we kind of um, we work through a range of scales and then we bring our kind of expertise um, from working at a small scale right through to the bigger scale and they, they all come, there's a cross contamination across the different scales and they, they, they seem to work well that way. So I'll just kind of um, bring you through, um, I suppose, the, the influence, I suppose, the main influence behind the way we work and which influ still influences our work today was comes from, a, I suppose, a time when I worked in RCR in Spain, which really opened my eyes to a new way to practice architecture, one which was more interested in experience and materiality and light and ref reflections and, and something a bit more uh, in depth with the senses. Um, and in parallel to that, I had um, I started to do um, a lot of construction workshops which uh, with a, a group called VAV, which was Daria um, Lakenin and Pablo Valinches. And uh, we did a few, we won a few competitions to build a few workshops around Europe. And we used these as uh, opportunities to uh, experiment with materials. And we did a series of material labs, is what we call them. So I experimented with lots of materials and did lots of trials with that. And that still was very influential with my work today. We also then did a few workshops with Kieran Donlin and Paul O'Brien and fellow students from DRT. And this is one image of that one which we did in Cadiz in, in Spain um, uh, out of Rome. So these are, I suppose, were influences on, on the focus of, uh, uh, of the work. So what I'm going to take you through now is some of the focuses on work and how give you a, a kind of a little insight into how they affect us and things we're quite passionate about and things that are um, drivers. So light and shadow, um, I suppose, are the protagonists in all our work. So be it natural or artificial, we, we tend to work with uh, light and how it hits off surfaces and how be they let be let them absorb light or reflect the light or kind of refract it or um, how shadow might hit off different surfaces and how that surface might change over time. These are things which we experiment with with kind of one to one prototypes um, and uh, models and it's it it is really the most important thing in, in our designs. So we often then look at photos and, and take examples of so of kind of other projects and, and the kind of experiences which might then inspire us for our projects. So here is on the right was a recent trip to Fadapur Sipri in India and you can see um, I suppose the depth of the light and the shadow and how that really changes that uh, your the atmosphere of that space. So some of these photos that you take as you travel around are really inspirational and, and kind of drivers in your project. On the left here is a photo I took in Spain of a um, a tree which was cast, uh, the light, uh, the shadow was cast onto a core tent steel surface and I suppose the, the in-between space between the tree and the surface and the light cast on it was just a really interesting um, really interesting play between the, the, the kind of natural and artificial and something that we're really interested in. So that kind of in-between space. And um, boundaries and thresholds um, I suppose more importantly, uh, ambiguous boundaries and thresholds are something, again, which is really uh, something I'm really interested in, how you can define space, how you can define rooms within spaces without building walls. So is that kind of by creating structures or screens or um, can you, you know, have split levels and can you work with um, transparent materials, mirrors? and define different zones, define different spaces, but allow kind of activities to happen simultaneously and um, without affecting each other. Or can you 
can these uh, new boundaries or thresholds uh, allow for activities which wouldn't um, typically happen side by side to contaminate each other and then allow for something a bit more interesting to happen. So it's something that's really interesting in their work. So here are some images of experiments and photos which we took which kind of illustrate some of these uh, ideas. Um, rules then, um, we're a bit OCD about rules. So I like to kind of write down and sketch in my sketchbook kind of all the rules for your project. So be it all, everything horizontal, in one material, vertical is another material. That's a really simplistic way to do it. But this is one project which I um, just to show here, just to highlight the rules within this project. So this was um, it's a build project. We're not going to show the build project because that's not allowed as part of the series, but we'll show some of the models um, and the experiments which um, test out these rules. So what we had here was three rails which would which would form all the elements of the space, be it the handrail which connected the ground and the first floor, be it the, the lighting which illuminated both the first and the ground floor, and the table for and up, upstairs and then the counter downstairs. So we worked with three rails which expanded and contracted um, and dependent what was required of it. So we then sketched out all the different de details to allow this to happen and then create models and you know we really stuck to the rules on this. So it, for us if we can solve all the elements of the brief within the rules and the sketch and the details that we create we, we continue with that project. If we hit a wall and we realize we can't detail some elements of the project within that rule set, we start again, we go back to the start. So we create new new concepts and new ideas which which allow us to satisfy all the elements of the brief. Of the brief. And again, as there are rules, we're allowed to break our rules. So sometimes um, we break the rules in certain circumstances just for the project to be better, and that's okay. So um, the rules are there to be broken, I suppose. Um, grids and systems, again, as we are not building in the real world, we need, like we, work with the, most the sizes and dimensions of the materials which we're working with. So if it's um, the dimensions of a piece of timber or a plywood or, um, or a rebar, whatever that element is we're working with, we create these grids or systems uh, or structures um, within which the client, after we go ahead, can build and expand the project so they're not ruining the, the idea and not uh, um, they're not affecting the whole idea of the project and also it allows for when projects change because budgets change, briefs change, etc, etc, as projects uh, go ahead. So if we have systems and grids which allow for that change to happen, it means it's a lot easier for, for things to um, to kind of, I suppose, shift and move within that and for the concept and the structure to remain uh, the same. So here's a plan of a, of a um, a trigger fish store in Black Rock, and um, where we have this grid system, and then here's a kind of extension in North Dublin, which we're working on at the moment, where we have these ribs, and um, which kind of go up and over a building and define and uh, outdoor spaces for um, the living and dining areas. And um, again, we are relatively new practice. We uh, so far haven't had any clients with lots and lots of money so we have to be really clever with how we work with materials and again even if we did have lots and lots of money to work with we like working with relatively standard materials and cheap materials and experimenting with them and light and shadow and seeing how we can create sort of extraordinary experiences so working with extraordinary things we try and create extraordinary experiences so on the right here we have um, a vase which was just built out of Perspex, um, and which is a tool for playing with refraction and reflection and holds these uh, fruit bowl, uh, pieces of fruit within this bowl in a kind of a more interesting way. Um, and again, it's just something really simple. And then we, so we use these one, uh, little experiments as testers to test out ideas we have about architecture and space, and they inform then some of our bigger projects. Um, as they become like tools or um, to experiment with bigger ideas. So again, texture materiality is key within our projects as well. So again, taking uh, some inspiration from time in RCR, um, 
and also due to the fact that I'm colorblind, I have more of a focus on materials and textures within it within materials than I suppose people who are not colorblind because I suppose I have, don't see as many colors so I'm more interested in textures so we would do a lot of testing with uh, putting materials side by side in sketching in photoshop montages just to test different tones different textures and see how they work together as a whole and spatial thing and once we kind of get that then we would we do and um, more tests of one to one on site to um, get samples and um, different prototypes. And um, we, we typically as well would work with two or three materials within the project, again, back to our rules and try and satisfy most of the elements within that project within those two or three materials. For us, it kind of gives more refined and more connectivity between the different elements of the project and also uh, allows you to kind of develop interesting details as well that are unique for the project. And then I suppose just to finish, um, I suppose the key driver for all our projects is the experience. Like at the end of the day, we look at ourselves as designing interesting experiences. Um, and if we're not doing that, we're not doing our job at, at the end of the day. So what we would look at when we're doing these jobs is we have photos which we pin up in the studio or just even having our computer and keep looking back at these as reminders of what is the experience what is the atmosphere we're trying to create and these images may be abstracted from the actual project that is constructed but they are usually influential in kind of helping us get there so Hopefully that gives you an idea of kind of how we work and our focus of our projects um, and it gives you a small bit of insight into the way we design. Um, if you want to know a bit more about DUA's practice and what we're up to at the moment, um, we've got a few jobs on site which will be four interesting projects which should be finished by the end of the year. So you, you can tune in to Instagram and follow us there and you should see a bit more about what's going on. Well, thanks for um, tuning in and thanks to AI and uh, good luck. Goodbye.